Um, we'll get started. Um, please help me welcome Alejandro Uratia. That's the Hudson Democrats chair. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all of you to be here. This is a, we are in trouble in times. I really believe the United States is a stress test of his democracy. And this is more important than ever to, to choose the right person to be on the, on the White House and to lead our country on the right way. So I, am, I admire, personally admire very much uh, Representative Tulsi Gabbard, not only for his uh, commitment to the nation, she's a soldier, she's an active soldier, that she was able to step down from his position on Congress to, 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 to serve as a soldier. She's some, somebody that doesn't follow the, the, the current, she speak up and she had the, the, the strength to do that. And I believe is, it could be a very strong voice at the, red, at, at the White House to be able to become a beacon of democracy and decency at the White House. So I'm very grateful with uh, uh, representative and candidate Tulsi Gabbard to join us here at Hudson Democrats. We are very grateful. And we run it with an applause to her, to welcome her to be with us today here. I have been talking in Spanish all day, and I am stuck with the language. And as a token of appreciation for you being with us here, we want to give you this T-shirt that we did for, yes, uh, that is uh, New Hampshire First in the Nation. Okay. If there is something you couldn't understand what I said, I can explain that to you later on. Muchas gracias. Can we give Alejandro a round of applause, please? Thank you, Alejandro, for your kind introduction and for your leadership here in Hudson County. Uh, is Grace here as well? Grace, there you are. Sorry I missed you on the way in. Nice shirt, we'll be matching. <laughs> Thank you both. I don't know, how many of you were here when um, we were supposed to be here last time, but there was, what I oh, I was sick. This was right after the debate, right? I, uh, I had gotten a bad cough, and so some of you had gathered. Raise your hands if you were here for that last one. All right, a couple of you, where I Skyped in from, uh, Atlanta, right? I think we were in Atlanta. Thank you for doing that, and uh, thanks for being able to continue, and thanks to all of you for coming out here tonight. I really, really appreciate it. I wanna say thanks to our hosts here. Uh, Josh Booley and his dad, Ray, are in the back. Uh, thanks for inviting us and giving us this space to gather together, and Justin, who's part of the team there, thank you so much, and Ray, thank you for your service uh, to our country in the United States Navy. We have uh, a, uh, an incredible group of volunteers who are here today and there are too many to list by name, but I'm so proud of the campaign that we have and the people-powered campaign that we are building. Uh, we take no PAC money, we take no lobbyist money, and really we are fueled and, and being uh, moved by uh, our volunteers who are working hard every day. If our volunteers, can you just raise and wave your hands? There we go, they're all gathered in the back, working hard. Thank you, I'm really, really grateful. It's, it's gathering together in spaces like this with people like you across this country that gives me so much hope for our future, for our future because we are the change. You know, there's a reason why our founding fathers chose those three most important words to begin our constitution, we the people, for two reasons, right? So that we the people would never forget the responsibility that we have to be actively engaged and informed and involved in this democracy, but also so that the leaders who we choose to elect never forget who they are supposed to be serving. 
we the people. And so as we look at the many challenges that we face, as we talk through how we want to solve these problems, I think it is most important that we stay focused on what this is all about, who it's really for. It's about every single one of you. It's about your children. It's about your loved ones, your neighbors, your community, our country uh, as a whole. Uh, about 161 years ago, Abraham Lincoln gave a speech uh, that was entitled, A House Divided Against Itself Cannot Stand. And during that time, I was just going back and reading about what was surrounding him at that time as he delivered this speech, and many of his colleagues were telling him that this was very controversial, it was not a speech he should deliver, but he delivered it um, to deliver a warning about how divisive things were then. But I think it speaks very loudly and clearly to us as a country as we look at the challenges we face today. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And sadly, this is exactly where we are as a country. Our, our country is deeply divided, whether it be based on partisan lines, one group voting for this party or this person, another group voting for a different party or a different person, or if it's based on racial lines, ethnic, religious, all of these different things that are unfortunately being used to tear us apart and divide us. When that actually goes counter to the vision that our founders had for our country, you know, as they were working through a lot of divisions, as they were trying to heal this nation and, and, and bridge these divides, recognizing that as we have very different ideas about how to solve problems, as we come from different places in our own experiences, in our backgrounds, our family stories, that ultimately we are strong when we stand together. When we, every one of us, are firmly rooted in that foundation of our constitution that serves as the bedrock for our country so that we can remember that our objective really is the same. You know, we're gathered here together today as many people are in different parts of the country because we care. We care for each other, we care for our country, and we care for the future, our future. Not only for the one that lies before us, but the one that we will leave behind for those who come after us. And it is this focus and this care that allows us to see past so much of the divisive, divisiveness and instead have the dialogue and the conversation built on this foundation of respect that we really need to have to solve problems, to work side by side, to build this brighter future. As Alejandro said, to make sure that our country, our White House, can once again become a beacon of light, of hope, of opportunity, of respect. These things are so important that we cannot take for granted. And we are the only ones that can make this happen. We are the only ones who can bring about uh, this change. Um, some critics uh, will come to me and uh, express their cynicism about, is this really possible? Uh, I spoke to a college student not long ago, or she just actually graduated from college, and she told me that she didn't think it was, that the lines are so deeply drawn in the sand of one side against the other side, that Washington is so divided, it is such a hyper-partisan environment that it's she didn't see how it's possible for us to be able to come together again because increasingly, year after year, it just keeps getting worse. Who here disagrees with this? You don't think our country is divided? Oh, no. I, I, I think we can it is. It, but we can't, right, you agree that we can fix it. I disagree with college. There you go. You disagree with the college student. Got it. <laughs> I was, gonna, I was about to try to understand, well, where are you living? <laughs> no, no, no. But, you, but you're right, though. You're right. And this was the conversation that I had with her. And it made me sad that she had lost all hope 
that we could come together as a future because of how bad it's become. But you are right, and this is what I conveyed to her, is that number one, failure is not an option. And this was how Abraham Lincoln closed that speech about a house divided against itself cannot stand. He said, we shall not fail. If we stand firm, we shall not fail. And that we that he's talking about is we the people. It's we the people. We are the ones who will bring about this change, both in selecting who we want to see leading our country, leaders who will put service above self, who will put the interests of the American people and our country above all else, leaders who will treat each other with respect and inspire this positive change within our country at the highest levels and within our communities, remembering who we all are as Americans, what it is that connects us, this common ground that we stand upon in this country, in the United States of America. Now, where I come from in Hawaii, uh, we have a word, aloha. Um, it is a word that is often mistakenly understood to mean hello and goodbye, but it means neither. Uh, someone said, well, hey, I was in second grade, and my teacher told me that word meant hello and goodbye. <laughs> Are you telling me she was wrong? I said, yeah, unfortunately, she was wrong. <laughs> but it's a word we, we use to greet each other. Uh, both in the beginning of conversations and when we are leaving because of its really, really special, powerful meaning. What aloha means really is I come to you with respect, that I come to you uh, with an open heart, with care and compassion, and seeing you, seeing each other for who we really are, seeing each other as brother and sister, as family, as children of God, as people who are all connected, and therefore then, as we are having our conversations, as we are living our lives and our relationships personally and professionally, that we are able to see past all of these differences that can sometimes get in the way of, of, of real dialogue and conversation. Um, and this is something that I've done my best just to live by in my own life, uh, to lead with, and, and to bring to Washington. Uh, we need a lot of aloha in Washington. Uh, it's something that um, can and must be applied in a very practical way. So I want to share with you a story of how I did that in a very practical way. I knew going into Washington as a, a new freshman Democrat being elected in 2012, uh, a Republican, strong Republican majority in the House of Representatives, very partisan environment, and trying to think about, okay, how can I practice this aloha in my work in Congress? How can I begin to reach out with respect uh, to my colleagues, start to build these relationships necessary for me to do my job, the job that I was hired to do by my constituents in Hawaii, to serve them, to deliver results for them. Uh, it would be easy to just turn my back and just say, well, hey, those the other teams in charge so I'm just going to hunker down and, and hang out with my team and just work hard until we get enough seats in Congress to win and then, and then think about how we can get things done. That probably would have been the easier path to take, but it was not the right path to take because that's not why I ran for Congress and that's not why people voted for me. They voted for me to do a job, to serve them, to work for them, to be their voice in Washington. And so I had an idea in how to begin to do this outreach. Uh, I called my mother in Hawaii, who makes this incredible macadamia nut toffee. And I thought, what better way than speaking through the universal language of food to be able to open some hearts um, and begin to establish these relationships. So I asked her if she would make 434 boxes of her toffee. <laughs> no big deal, right? <laughs> My mother, uh, she and my dad just celebrated 51 years of marriage yesterday. They raised five kids. I know it's a rare thing these days. And um, so my mom thought it was a great idea. She said, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm in, I wanna help. I said, I actually have one more favor to ask. And for all of the moms in here, you know that no matter how old your children get, they're always calling home, right? 
saying, hey, mom, I need some help. <laughs> I asked if she would make another 435 bigger boxes of toffee for the staff of every member of Congress. And again, she's an amazing woman. She paused, I think, only just to start processing how much longer that would take her, how many more pounds of macadamia nuts she would need. Uh, but she understood why it was important. So she got to work in Hawaii. She's stirring both pots of toffee at the same time, chopping the mac nuts, pouring the toffee. Uh, she had my dad assisting her uh, in the job he chose for himself, which was to uh, be the quality control officer, uh, supervising and taking a slice out of every single pan that she poured. I'm not even joking. Uh, and while they were doing this and wrapping the toffee in Hawaii, I was uh, just handwriting personal notes to every one of my new colleagues, uh, going online, looking up information, seeing what their backgrounds were, just getting uh, better informed about who they are, and signing every one of these notes saying, I look forward to serving with you. The incredible thing was that as we began to deliver these, uh, these little gifts of aloha, how quickly I got a response that on the House floor, as we are there casting votes, it's the only time that all 435 of us are in the same room at the same time, that members of Congress who I normally would not have the opportunity to work with, uh, chair, chairmen and women of important committees in Congress, started to make that long walk across the House floor from the Republican side to the Democrat side, finding me and just saying thank you. Thank you. Many of them saying, I ate all the candy, I need more before I can go home this weekend. And then most importantly, asking me, tell me what issues your constituents are concerned about. You know, what are the things that you're coming here that you wanna tackle? I'm the chair of this committee or that committee, this is what I've been working on, or how many years I've been involved in this or that. Let's work together, I wanna help. That simple gesture of reaching out with aloha, with respect, without preconditions, without purity tests, without picking and choosing, well, I'll talk and work with this person, but not that person. Reaching out with respect to everyone, focused on this mission that we all share together of service, of putting service above self, putting the interests and the well-being of the American people ahead of politics, ahead of profits, ahead of uh, special interests and in corporations, putting the well-being of the people of our country first. And it was because of this outreach, this laying a foundation based on respect, that I've been able to be very effective throughout my seven years in Congress, where at a time with a strong Republican majority, uh, I was able to actually pass legislation, something that a lot of people said was impossible, that I shouldn't even waste my time trying to do uh, from the beginning. That, uh, you know, when introducing amendments to, um, you know, some of the larger bills that get through Congress, being told, well, hey, look, Republicans will never support it, don't even try. And the leadership opposing my bill or my amendment, it's because of those relationships that I had that I had my phone calls returned. That when I'm texting my colleagues saying, hey, my bill's coming up for a vote, I need your support, they would respond and say, okay, tell me why. Instead of just going along with the party line, which is often what happens in Washington. If it's a Republican bill, Republicans vote for it, Democrats vote against it. If it's a Democrat bill, Democrats vote for it, Republicans vote against it. That's, that's the norm rather than every member of Congress looking at the substance of each piece of legislation and saying, okay, what are the pros and cons? Will this help people or will this hurt people? So instead of just towing the party line, I was able to have these conversations where my colleagues knew and trusted because of this relationship that I would tell them the truth. I would make my case that I wasn't gonna try to screw them over or set them up for, for failure and no, not, not every single one of them came my way, but on many of these cases, I was able to convince enough people, making the case based on the substance of my legislation, to support it, because it was the right thing to do. This is the leadership that I will bring 
as your president and commander in chief, reaching across the aisle, treating every single American with respect, not seeing one group of Americans as part of my team and the rest as deplorables, seeing every single American with respect and bringing about the kind of leadership that puts your well-being and your interests ahead of all else every single day. Uh, as we go on here, we have our volunteers. They're going to pass around some gold-wrapped macadamia nut toffee. <laughs> My mom's recipe. <laughs> so you can get a little taste of, of how my colleagues felt uh, when I first got elected and, and the magic of this stuff. It's dangerously addictive, so you've been warned. <laughs> But this is, this is what we're talking about at a very practical level. And this is what I shared with that college student about how we can and must move forward together and how I will lead uh, as president, Ex not accepting failure as an option, being inspired by the example of Abraham Lincoln and so many other leaders who have come before us facing very difficult challenges and divisive times but always leading with love and with care and compassion and putting the well-being in the interests of the American people above all else. Now, there's a lot of different issues that we will tackle together. As president, I will take on and hold to account Big Pharma, those who are perpetrating this opioid epidemic across our country, those who have lied and cheated and dis intentionally deceived people just to make more money, ruining people's lives, taking people's lives in the process. I've introduced legislation uh, that begins this process, the Opioid Accountability Act, that would hold those responsible accountable and would take the fines and the dollars that would come from these cases and earmark them specifically for those survivors of this epidemic to help them through recovery, to help provide those desperately needed resources to those who are struggling with abuse and addiction to get the help that they need uh, as they walk this long path towards recovery. I will hold big pharma and big insurance uh, accountable and take them away from the policy making table. When you look at so many of the pieces of legislation related to our health care that have come before Congress, you see in this pay to play culture in Washington how their high-powered and high-paid lobbyists have a tremendous amount of influence over the legislation that affects our everyday lives. Uh, I want to take the opportunity to recognize AARP, who's here. Um, I'm so grateful that at almost every meeting we have, and I know other campaigns as well, there are AAP, AARP volunteers who are coming with your red shirts and jackets. And I just love the message. I don't know if you want to just stand up so people can see you here for a second. And I can give you the mic if you want to say a word or two. <laughs> Thank you. But you see her, her jacket, it says, Stop Greed. And we're everywhere. You are everywhere. And you are a nonpartisan organization fighting for people. Exactly. Exactly. It says, Stop Greed, Lower. Exactly, now. Stop the greed. And, and your message is so crystal clear because it cuts to the heart of what is wrong with our entire healthcare system now. It's being driven by greed and profits rather than, hey, how do we better take care of our people? Whether it's our grandparents, our parents, us, our children, at every single age. And so when, when we have these conversations in our community about how we can improve healthcare, the number one thing we've got to do is take away the crony capitalism and the greed that has infected this healthcare system that unfortunately really isn't about healthcare at all, really. It's, it's sick care, right? We're, we're not placing a high level of importance on, on prevention and wellness and doing more to be able to encourage a healthier society and prevent people from getting sick in the first place. So you have, every one of you have my personal commitment that in the Gabbard administration, big pharma and big insurance will have no seat 
at our table as we are forming the health care policies that will guarantee quality health care for every single American that will allow those who, if you have a, a great private insurance or if your employer is offering one, if you choose to go down that route, obviously you should have that choice. But for the single mom of four who I met earlier today just across the road or just down the way at Cookies Cafe, whose son is 25 years old, was born with uh, severe disabilities and who needs a lung transplant he doesn't know if he can get it because they've got to come up with $30,000. He is on Medicare. He is on Medicaid. They're going to cover the cost just of the surgery itself, but all the other things that he needs around the surgery to, to make sure it's successful, thirty-five grand. Thirty-five grand. So, you know, her boss, they're trying to, they got a donation can out there, the community to chip in. They're trying to get people together to make sure that this young man's life can be saved. But they don't know if they can raise it. I asked her, I said, well, do you have a GoFundMe page? Because I'd love to help spread the word. I'd love to get more people to chip in, whether it's 20 bucks or whatever you can. And you know what she told me? No, we're not allowed to do that because if we have a GoFundMe page, they'll count those dollars as income and he will lose his apartment, and he will lose his health care. So the predicament that this young man is in, and his mother, who is so worried sick about his ability to live and be able to breathe properly and get this lung transplant, points to the corruption and the problem within our health care system. People like her and her son and so many families across our country should be able to live with the peace of mind that when you're at that most difficult moment in your life, when you or your loved one needs care, that you'll be able to get it. No matter where you work or what your zip code is or what your family background is or the color of your skin, none of these things should stand in the way of us as, as Americans living in the greatest and wealthiest nation in the world to be able to ensure quality health care for every person. There are, um, thank you, thank you. I want to be able to open it up to uh, questions here. I want to hear what's on your mind in just a few moments. So I will wrap up, sir. We will come to you first. Um, as, as I know, we'll, we'll be able to talk about many of the other challenges, whether it's climate change, immigration reform, criminal justice reform. There's a lot of other issues that we need to address. I do want to uh, close on one issue that is central to all of these other issues, uh, and that is the cost of war. Foreign policy is domestic policy, yet very rarely in this presidential campaign, or even campaigns in the past, do you see a major focus on foreign policy? Which doesn't make sense for two big reasons. Number one is the most important responsibility the president has is to serve as commander in chief. I would think I, as, as voters, you would wanna be best informed about who is most qualified to serve as commander in chief, right? And number two, those decisions that are made related to our foreign policy have direct impacts on every single one of us in our everyday lives, whether you realize it or you're confronted with it or not. Now, I've served as a soldier now in the Army National Guard for almost 17 years. I have uh, deployed twice to the Middle East, my first deployment in a medical unit, where every single day we were confronted with the terribly high human cost of war. I've served in Congress now for seven years, going on eight, and throughout this time I've served on the Homeland Security Committee, the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Armed Services Committee, uh, gaining experience and understanding related to our national security and foreign policy, and seeing firsthand who actually benefits most from our country's long-standing policy of 
waging regime change wars, toppling dictators, uh, follow on nation building missions. It is not our country that benefits. Our national security is most often undermined as uh, terrorist groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda are strengthened. It's the military industrial complex and a lot of fancy Washington consultants who make a whole lot of money uh, off of this continued policy. Um, the cost of war takes a toll on every one of us as Americans because we are the ones who are paying the price. Just in Afghanistan alone, right now, we are paying $4 billion a month. $4 billion a month. So it begs the question, what are we getting for our money? What are we trying to accomplish? That's five and a half million dollars an hour. Five point five million dollars an hour going towards a war and nation building mission that some of the highest leaders in the Pentagon, now it's been revealed behind closed doors, they're scratching their heads saying, what are we even doing there? What are we trying to accomplish? What does quote unquote winning look like? And they can't answer that question. I've long advocated for bringing our troops home from Afghanistan to stop wasting American taxpayer dollars there in wars, regime change wars and nation building missions there and instead redirect those dollars towards serving the needs of our people and our communities, nation building right here at home. This is the change that I will bring about as president, getting our priorities straight. Ending these regime change wars, ending these nation building missions, this new Cold War and nuclear arms race, taking care of our veterans and making sure that we are re redirecting our taxpayer dollars right here at home. We need a commander in chief who will make the right decisions to ensure the safety, security and freedom of the American people and our country and I bring the experience necessary that's prepared me to do that job on day one. Every single one of us pays the price for war. Now, I'm not a pacifist. I don't live in a dreamland. I live in the real world where I understand that unfortunately sometimes war may be necessary to protect and defend the American people. But as commander in chief, I will lead and maximize all diplomatic measures, building relationships with other countries, leading with cooperation rather than conflict, making sure that if we're sending my brothers and sisters into harm's way, that we are sending them on missions that are truly worthy of their great sacrifice and that war should always be the last resort. If you agree with this leadership that we need in our country, then I want to personally invite every single one of you here to join me, to join our campaign, to join this movement towards this bright future where we are served by a government that is truly of, by, and for the people. Thank you very much. We'll open it up to questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got a couple people walking around with the microphone. We'll start here with you, sir. Good afternoon. I've been looking over the chessboard, and it seems that Trump won in Florida, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin with a minority of the vote. Mm -hmm. He won by 11,000 votes in Michigan, while the Libertarians got 16 times that number of votes. In and Michigan? If, in Michigan. Hmm, I did not know that. If the Libertarians had been allowed in the presidential debates, then the Libertarians, two former Republican governors, probably would have taken more votes away from Trump, and the Democrats may have wound up winning hmm. in those states. Now, uh, if you find an organization that would sponsor, that would run presidential debates and allow the libertarians to participate and invite the Republicans if they choose or not to, 
uh, that, I like that chess move because it gets Donald Trump out of the White House, me and anyone but Trump, uh, and because it would allow the libertarians to present their solutions to more voters. And I think you would like that chess move because it would help get you elected. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. What's your name, sir? I'm Tom Alsier. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Um, look, I, I think I, I want to get to kind of the, the heart of the issue that you're raising, which is that um, we need a fair and impartial system that allows for uh, more than just the two parties to be represented and that we allow voters to be able to hear the voices of those who are uh, seeking to serve our country. Um, I think that, that the concentration of power that exists within these two parties that's really fueled by money um, does a disservice uh, to the American people in a lot of ways as we see how uh, that imbalance of, of power um, exists and, and, and the negative consequences uh, that, come, that come from that. Yes, sir. You know, you say everything about foreign policies and everything else. Well, I'm a truck, a truck driver, and I've been doing that for 34 years. What do you think about the autonomous trucks that are coming out and the whole industry and the trucking industry? It's really falling apart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have grave concerns about what the impacts of this automation revolution uh, will have. Uh, look, I think that there's not any one single answer to this. I, I personally think there are a lot of uh, safety concerns and other issues related to these changes. Uh, it's, it seems like it's a matter of time, and I'd, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on this, that it's not really a matter of if, but when at this point, and that we as a country need to be best prepared to empower those who are in a situation like yourself maybe those who haven't been driving their whole careers but are deep into that right now and their family depends on that income to be able to survive, about what happens next. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, and also, yes, and also I wanted to add is because of the real strict regulations out there and everything else that's come out in the last 15 years that really put a damper on this uh, trucking industry because the rates have fallen dramatic, drastically. The rates and of what you're being paid? Yes, yes. And I don't know whether, see, the last time you were in Nashua, I believe, my buddy John here handed you a packet of information. Yeah. Did you ever read that? I started to read it, and I passed it on to my staff, as he mentioned that you guys were going to be going to Washington, D.C. to start correct. looking at passing legislation to help be able to protect those of you who are working in this industry. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate, we'll, we'll, get, we'll grab that from you before we go. Um, the work that you're doing to raise more awareness about the challenges that you all are facing. Uh, look, I think that um, this, is a big, this is a big topic and I'm not gonna claim to have the answer in every single respect on this, but I think one area that, that can and will help those who are making this transition uh, is, is a universal basic income. I think that will help provide a layer of economic security uh, for those like yourselves who may be faced with this um, serious and massive change in your lives about what happens next and where do you go? How do you transfer these skills to something else and what other opportunities are gonna be available for you? I've talked to some other folks who are in a similar position as yourself have gone through some of these things with people in my home state of Hawaii who spent their entire careers working on the sugar plantations in our state. Well, just in the last few years, the very last sugar plantation in our state shut down. The sugar mill closed. And so they were given some, some uh, money for transition assistance, but for a lot of them, they're like, oh, okay, well, you can go and get retrained, but you know, for someone who's 40, 50, 65 years old, they're thinking, what kind of retraining am I gonna go do? And so we've gotta get to um, just the reality of the situation and recognize in some ways the inevitability of what's coming, 
but making sure that we are standing up for our brothers and sisters and walking together through this process. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi. Good evening, first Hi. of all, and welcome to New Hampshire. Thank you. I have to say, if I were from Hawaii, I'd probably rather be there in December, but. <laughs> <laughs> I love my country, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I want to ask a serious question related to your vote on impeachment that took place recently because as most people in the room know, you had a very unique vote. You didn't tow the party line. You voted present on both articles of impeachment. And the question I have for you is if there was incontrovertible evidence of a high crime or misdemeanor, would you, voted, would you have voted yes on those articles of impeachment? Yeah. Uh, this is this is part of the the problem, though, is that throughout this process, um, it was and continues to be extremely partisan, and this is something that the founders warned against in the Federalist Papers that that the process they feared that the process would result in a conclusion that was based on the strength of one party over another rather than an objective assessment of innocence or guilt. And that such an outcome would only further divide uh, our country. This is why I voted present to take a stand for our country, to take a stand for the people. Uh, and that we can and should defeat Donald Trump for his multiple wrongdoings and abuses of power and defeat him and throw him out of office there so that we can come together as a country and move forward together. Uh, it's also why I introduced a censure resolution that listed many other areas that were not included in any impeachment articles or even discussed throughout that whole process of decisions that Donald Trump has made that were clearly unconstitutional and illegal, taking military action, dropping bombs in another country without congressional approval, uh, vetoing a war powers resolution from Congress to stop supporting Saudi Arabia's genocide in Yemen. Uh, there are, are many other areas that I think should have been discussed but weren't. And given the reality of the situation, I do not want to see Donald Trump further emboldened and uh, strengthened as he, as he will be, as the Senate will exonerate Trump, they will proclaim his innocence and, and he'll then take that message across the country and unfortunately we're likely to see his support grow as so a result of that. Just a quick follow up, so by the absence of your yes vote, does that mean you believe there was not in con any incontrovertible evidence? I'm saying that the crime. process was flawed. The entire process was flawed, which is why I could not in good conscience vote either yes or no. Trump has committed many acts of wrongdoing that I believe have made our country less safe and not serve the interests of the American people. It's why I'm so committed to defeating him and, and working to earn the support of Americans across the country so that we can remove him from office in November of 2020. But none rising to the high crime or misdemeanor level. The, the problem is with the process. That's the issue. And if the process itself is flawed, then, then we aren't really able to have a clear look at what levels and what has he done and what should have and could have been uh, included. And that was why I chose to take the vote that I did. One from this side. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on uh, the things that often precede these uh, foreign regime change wars, and that's the covert uh, actions taken by, uh, by our government. Uh, a lot of people don't know that in uh, 1949 in Syria, uh, the United States uh, back to coup, and uh, <coughs> uh, uh, ironically enough, uh, the guy who wrote the uh, the Afghanistan papers in the Washington Post, uh, Craig Whitlock, he also wrote uh, an article on April 17th, uh, 2011, about the United States involvement uh, in uh, Syria in 2006. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering uh, what your thoughts are on uh, stopping these uh, covert actions to overthrow governments. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, so often the, the stories that we hear in the news about um, 
some of these wars, regime change wars, whether they are using uh, you know, military means or covert means through the CIA or this modern day siege tactic of draconian sanctions to try to overthrow a government. The backstory is often not told and we, the pe we don't often find out what's really happened until maybe sometimes decades later as, as happened with Iran and the CIA's role in overthrowing Mossadegh. Um, at that time. That was a regime change war that a lot of people didn't know the U.S. was involved in until many, many years later when those documents were declassified. And I think that's really what's, what's at issue here is um, my position that the United States should not try to play this role of being the police of the world. And we should not be in the business of going and overthrowing dictators that we don't like. Um, even when under the guise of humanitarianism, because when we look throughout history in many different parts of the world as, as our country has done this, it's actually resulted in more suffering and struggles for the people in those countries. And it's, it's, it's undermined the interests uh, of our country, whether we're talking about in recent past, Iraq, Libya, Syria, uh, Afghanistan. You can go on and on uh, down the list and you see how there's some hypocrisy there because some dictators, the United States says, well, we've got to go and overthrow this evil dictator, but there are other dictators in other countries that the United States props up and supports and even calls allies and partners. Uh, so this is something that, um, that I will end uh, as president, end this longstanding practice of regime change and nation building and instead focus on these decisions about when and where our military takes action or, or our role in engaging with other countries based on what's in the best interest of our country and our national security, and really having the foresight to look at what are the consequences down the line of those actions that we are taking, and will they actually help people in other countries, or will, or will it hurt? That's something that doesn't happen often enough. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Hi. First, I want to say that I think you're amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, my question is about how are you going to deal with foreign leaders who don't take women like at seriously like women? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's how a are good you going to deal with that as a president? That's a good question. Is this something I've actually dealt with? Uh, dealt with before, not not obviously as president or or, or uh, in in the political capacity, but during my second deployment um, to the Middle East, I deployed as a platoon leader, and one of our platoon's missions was to <coughs> conduct training, uh, counterterrorism training with the Kuwait Army, the Kuwaiti Army, and so as the platoon leader, I was the lieutenant. I had my sergeant, and we brought some of our soldiers. We went um, to their camp to begin this training. And from the outset, I was told, well, they don't allow women onto their camp. Obviously, I had a mission. I went anyway. And the, the guard at the gate who looked at our ID cards, he was a little puzzled when he looked at me, but he waved us on through. And then as we went and um, kind of went down the line and started meeting the, sol the Kuwaiti soldiers that we'd be training, half of them completely did not acknowledge that I existed at all. They wouldn't shake my hand, they wouldn't make eye contact. It was as though I were invisible to them, simply because I'm a woman. And the way that I treated this whole situation was, look, I, I get their cultural background and differences and whatever it is where they're coming from, but I knew what my mission was and I let my actions speak louder than anything else. And so we went, we did this training. We did it a few days a week. We went and we shot them how, we, we showed them um, how to shoot their firearms. Uh, we showed them how to conduct basic uh, counterterrorism tactics, how to clear buildings, how to deal with uh, civil um, disobedience and, and riots and, and all these different things. And what I found was that as time went on, they saw me not as a woman with whatever their preconceived notions were, but as a fellow soldier who they grew to respect because of the experience and the leadership that I brought uh, to the table. And 
what this resulted in was on graduation day when they were done with their training course, they all gathered together, not in a room, not unlike this, uh, and their commander, who's a very um, conservative Muslim man, he called me up to the front in front of all of his soldiers and he presented me with a plaque, an award for appreciation for the training that I and my soldiers had given to his unit. And as we left, there was someone else who was there who'd been working with these guys for a long time. He just said, Tulsi, I hope you understand what just happened, what it took for this commander to recognize a woman in front of his subordinates, in front of his soldiers, and what kind of a historic thing uh, that was. So whatever the obstacles are, whoever it is that I'm dealing with, um, it is my practice to say, okay, my actions and my leadership uh, will allow me to be able to overcome the obstacles that others may place before us. Uh, people will see through that I mean business and that I will not be detracted away from my mission of working for and representing our country with strength and with pride. I just have a, both a comment and a question. First, right. my comment was uh, just thank you for uh, helping bring down Kamala Harris's campaign. We really dodged a bullet with that one. <laughs> my question was, um, you um, emphasize being a uniter in chief, kind of uniting the country across partisan lines. I know one of your biggest issues is um, ending foreign wars and also protecting civil liberties. And I know there are a lot of Republicans who, both in Congress and in just in the country in general, who agree with that kind of goal. So I want to know what your favorite Republican in Congress has been to work with on that issue in the spirit of that question. Thank you. Um, that's a really good question. You know, I have worked with um, a lot of my Republican colleagues on a lot of different issues. Uh, you mentioned uh, civil liberties. Uh, I worked a lot with, uh, he's now retired, but former Congressman Trey Gowdy on issues related to civil liberties and privacy. Uh, I've worked with, um, he's now an independent, but Congressman Justin Amash and Congressman Tom Massey, um, uh, now passed away Congressman Walter Jones on issues related to ending uh, presidential wars, respecting the Constitution and the role that Congress has to be the body that decides whether or not to declare war. Uh, I've worked with a Republican colleague in Florida, uh, Congressman Brian Mast, who is also a combat veteran, uh, who lost three limbs in his service as an EOD tech on veterans-related issues, something that we're currently working on that has to do with making sure that our generation of post-9-11 veterans um, does not have to deal with what our Vietnam veterans faced in Agent Orange, as so many of our generation of veterans have been exposed to toxic burn pits and many suffering and struggling with rare cancers and really terrible um, respiratory illnesses because of that exposure. Um, I've worked with Congressman Will Hurd. I've, I've worked with a lot of different people in Congress on a lot of different issues, finding those areas uh, where we can find agreement and common ground and really present that united front to the American people and saying, hey, look, as divided as things are, we have great opportunities to come together to be able to tackle uh, some of the greatest issues uh, of our time. And on those issues where we disagree, we still respect each other and we still maintain friendships because of, of um, that foundation of respect. Hi, I'm Robbie. Hi. Um, we have a problem with politicians, well, people taking positions of power in government, and then they become very rich. Mm -hmm. And um, I've always wondered how that happens. Yes. <laughs> maybe they, they don't have, you know, the 200K a year, maybe somewhere around there, and then they become very rich. I mean, would you support something like... Uh, all congressmen, women, senators, presidents, etc., and apparently their family members too, to get like yearly or every two years they get audited by 
uh, you know, like independent parties. Because if, if something like that happened, I think we'd see big changes in how politicians push, you know, foreign aid to other countries over the homeland. I mean, I just, what's your thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, thank you. This is a really important issue. You know, I talked a little bit earlier about this pay to play culture in Washington and uh, this revolving door that we see between uh, members of Congress and, and senior staffers uh, who work across different industries in Washington uh, very often will go from spending some time in the in this public service arena and it, and it is and must be public service but then leaving and getting big payouts um, working in the industries that were supposed to be exercising oversight over whether it was you know a committee of jurisdiction for a member of Congress or a staffer working for the FCC or the SEC or the FDA, um, go down the list of acronyms there where people will then go and work and, and get a big, uh, a big paycheck from the industry that they were supposed to be regulating. Uh, so yes, there must be transparency in um, not only where members of Congress and their spouses are getting their income from, are they abusing their position of influence and, and getting personally, financially benefiting from those relationships. Um, but I think we have, to, we have to go even farther because right now already there's an annual form that every one of us must fill out that is a financial disclosure form. So you could look it up for every single member of Congress and their spouse to look at, okay, where are you getting your income from? What stocks are you investing in? And we've seen there's a congressman who actually just resigned because he was, um, I don't, I don't remember the details, but the bottom line is he was in a, in a position of power on a committee. Turns out he was a major shareholder in a company and he was encouraging other members of Congress to invest in the company and then made decisions in Congress that would benefit that company. I think it was a pharmaceutical company. I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about? Chris Cooper. Chris Cooper? Collins. Chris Collins, exactly. Um, and he's being, I think, indicted for it now. So making sure that that transparency is there and the accountability is there is important. I don't think members of Congress should be allowed to invest in stocks, period. I don't think that they should be in a position where they can personally benefit off of those decisions that are made. Because whether you're on the, on the committee of jurisdiction or not, every one of us ultimately has to vote on bills related to every single sector. Uh, in our economy, directly or indirectly, and no one should be in a position of being able to benefit from that. I think members of Congress should not be allowed to become lobbyists after they leave Congress. Neither should senior staffers. Um, closing this revolving door in our government, I think, will do a lot towards reducing that level of corruption and influence um, that is being exploited by too many people in positions of power for their own personal financial gain. Uh, just like we see, how many teachers, do we have any teachers who are here today or former teachers? Thank you for your service. Teachers, nurses, firefighters, law enforcement officers, school counselors, mental health professionals. When you go down um, this list, these are people who choose to serve. They're not getting into these work, right? I mean, you didn't get into this for the money, did you? No, no of course not. Yeah, because there's not much money there. <laughs> you get into it because you, you love teaching and you want to serve and you want to you help our kids. Uh, those who get into public service must be in it to serve and not be using that as a stepping stone or a way for them to financially exploit that position of service for their own uh, personal gain. We have time for one more question. Okay, so I've just learned about you recently, okay. and uh, I, from what I heard, you have my support. Thank you. Um, but before that, um, I felt like I needed to settle for the uh, other people that I knew about, like the big names, like Warren and uh, Sanders. So my question is, uh, how do you plan to stand up against these people that are more like household names uh, compared to you? I'm counting on you to help me do that. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you. Thank you for your support and thank you for your question uh, because this is real. I'm not as famous as some of the best known candidates in the race 
And I think a lot of the national polls, especially that people are seeing, um, are really more of an indication of who is most famous and well known, rather than an indication of of voters having equal amounts of information on every candidate and then making their decisions accordingly, right? And so I appreciate you taking the time to learn more and to come today, and I'm grateful to have your support. Uh, but our challenge and our opportunity uh, as a grassroots people-powered campaign is challenge. We've got to get better known and we've got to get the word out to others. Uh, and what we're finding is that the more we're able to do that, uh, the more our support grows. And so for our campaign, we are uh, using every platform possible to do that. We're holding town halls like this every single day, uh, going out into different towns and communities and reaching out to people. I've seen a couple of people who I saw earlier today um, but in the coffee shop and invited you to come. Thank you for coming.